Good evening, everyone. I want to thank you very much for coming here tonight. Um, my name is Mark Brown, and I'm a partner at Goldberg Sagala, and I'm president of the UV Law Alumni Association. I want to thank you all for being here for a really what will be a tremendous night. It's truly a privilege and an honor to be here and to represent the Law Alumni Association at this 57th annual dinner. And I'd like to take a moment to welcome all of our guests and to introduce the head table. Seated on the dais, from your left to my right, or I must say my right to your left, either one. We have here <laughs> Caroline Potasek, recipient of the Public Service Award and the District Attorney for Niagara County. Next to her is Dr. Charles Zukowski. He's the Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs at the University of Buffalo. We next have Lenora Foote Beaver from the class of 97, recipient of the Community Service Award. She's an Executive Assistant to the Presiding Justice of the New York State Supreme Court Appellate Division Fourth Department and is a past president of the Law Alumni Association. We next have, next to Lenora, Dr. Satish Tripathi, President of the University of Buffalo. <laughs> next to Dr. Tripathi, we have Dan Oliverio from the class of 1982, recipient of the Private Practice Award. He is a partner and chair, chairman emeritus at Hodgson Russ LLP and a member of the Dean's Advisory Council. We next have Eileen Fleischman, recipient of the Non-Alumna Award, is the Vice Dean at the Law School and the first and only Executive Director this Law Alumni Association has ever had. <laughs> now on my left, we have Scott Becker, President-Elect for the Law Alumni Association and partner with Kavanoki Cook. Scott will be taken over as President of the Law, Law Alumni Association in June. Next to Scott, we have Dean Aviva Abramowski, the 19th Dean of the University of Buffalo School of Law, and truly a tremendous honor to have you here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Christopher Whiteman from the class of 99, one of my classmates, recipient of the Business Award, is a partner at PJT Partners and a member of the Dean's Advisory Council. We next have Melissa Nixon from the class of 1997, a member of the UB Law Alumni Association's Board of Directors. She's co-chair of the annual dinner committee and will co-present tonight's awards presentation. Melissa is a court attorney referee for the Alternative Dispute Program in Supreme Court. <laughs> next to Melissa, we have Judge Alexander Hunter Jr. from the class of 1974. Judge Hunter is the recipient of the Judiciary Award. He's a judge on the United Nations Dispute Tribunal for, the, for New York City, Geneva, and Nairobi, and a Judicial Hearing Officer, Criminal Court of the City of New York. And last, but certainly not least, we have Kevin Espinosa from the class of 2009, a member of the UB Law Alumni Association's Board of Directors. He's co-chair of the annual dinner committee and will co-present tonight's award with Melissa. Kevin is Vice President and Assistant General Counsel at m and Bank. I want to take a moment uh, to thank everyone who's here tonight and also thank you for those who have joined the Law Alumni Association. Um, as many people in the room already know, the association membership provides current law students with career advice, mentoring, connections with jobs. They help recruit prospective students, help participate on admissions and career panels. We judge moot courts, just to name a few of the many ways that we make a difference in this law school and in the lives of our students. We support the association's tuition scholarships and the public interest summer fellowship for our law students. Each year, we designate Law Alumni Association scholars as well as a Gold Group scholar. And for those who are not aware, 
The Gold Group stands for the graduates of the last decade, and specifically, I know Aaron Sakin has done a great job in that capacity. So, Aaron, if you could step up for a second, acknowledge you for all that you've done with the Gold Group. As you'll see around the room, and specifically these little twinkling stars, it's not your eyesight, it actually, these are twinkling stars. They're, they're all Alumni Association members. The funds we receive in our membership drive is extremely important and helps create the programs that you're enjoyed by not just those in this room, but by many more alumni who are not even here, who are not here tonight. If you are not yet a member, please consider joining our group tonight. We have yearly memberships and we have life memberships that cost only $1,200 over the sets, less for the entirety of your life. So it's actually a really good deal for those who are younger and can take that. <laughs> our members in Buffalo and in our regional chapters receive benefits including free or discounted admission to our social and our networking events, free New York State CLEs, and free remote access to online databases through our online alumni portal. So please consider joining us today. I'd like to take a moment now to introduce Dean Aviva Abramowski. Dean Abramowski is the law school's 19th permanent dean and the first woman to hold this position since 1887. <laughs> dean Abramowski is an expert in insurance law, commercial law, regulation of financial entities, and legal ethics, and she is the current editor of the LSN Insurance Law, Legislation, and Policy. Her scholarship has been recognized as a, quote, litigation essential by LexisNexis. Dean Abramowski has twice served as an academic evaluator for the American Bar Association's Federal Judiciary Committee, once for United States Supreme Court nominee Samuel Alito, and again for U.S. Supreme Court nominee Sonia Sotomayor. She's a past chair and executive board member of the insurance law section of the American Association of Law Schools and is the chair of its committee on sections. Dean Abramowski, prior to her appointment as dean of the University of Buffalo School of Law, she was the Kaufman Professor of Entrepreneurship and Innovation and an associate dean at Syracuse University School College of Law, where she led the school's internationalization efforts. In addition, just yesterday, Dean Abramowski received the Lamplighter Award by the 8th Judicial District's Gender and Racial Fairness Committee during their Women in the Law Awards luncheon. It's truly an honor to introduce Dean Abramowski. Well, thank you, Mark Brown, right? He's had the unenviable job of trying to make me look good for an entire year. <laughs> Um, I want to thank everyone here in the Law Alumni Association for inviting me to be part of this night with you. I'm honored to be seated among these incredible recipients of our awards. Um, and I'm incredibly proud of their accomplishments, though I myself have done so little to advance them. This is what tonight is all about. Tonight's our opportunity to share our pride in our law school and our graduates in our university and our city, and to celebrate all that we have accomplished together. How many of you remember Buffalo's Talking Proud campaign? Yeah? Very popular in the 1980s? Well, I think it's time for this law school and this community to talk a lot because we have a lot to be proud of. And I want you to know that I purposely emphasize the word our. When I look out, this is only my second year as dean here. This is my second Law Alumni Association Awards Banquet. And I want you to know that when I look out at everyone, it isn't strangers, I'm not new, you are friends. And we are all working together and we are succeeding together because it is our city, this is our university, and it is our law school. Thank you. Which means, of course, that I must thank President Tripathi. Yes? I'm grateful for your support to our law school, and I'm proud to be a member of your team. I'd also like to thank Mark Brown, the entire Law Alumni Association, the Gold Group Board of Directors, of course, the Provost, Charles Zukowski, for, for everybody's efforts this year. Another round of applause, please. One of our successes that we have worked so hard on is creating mentorship opportunities. I, I, a lot of you in this audience have met me one on one, and what have I asked you to do? Right? Help a law student get a job. Mentor, 
right? Do not pick the ladder up behind you, and you have succeeded. I want you to know that. We're up over 11% in jobs in two years. This is a credit to everyone in this room. It reflects a concerted effort. It reflects the power of this alumni association because you care about each other, you care about making space for the next generation. I call upon you to continue to do it. I ask you to remember every year we graduate exceptional students, every year we need internships, every year they need another place, and every year they deserve it. And I can go to sleep at night because I know you will make that space for them. So I want to thank you. And someday, if you work really, really hard, you'll be on this dais getting an award. <laughs> Tonight's honorees, Judge Alexander Hunter began his judicial career as a city court judge and now serves on a global level. Hearing appeals at the United Nations Dispute Tribunal, congratulations. Dan Olivero is Chairman Emeritus of Buffalo's largest law firm, employing more than 150 attorneys in Western New York alone. Thank you, Hodgson. I think you've got four tables, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> There is no need for you to be quiet in my decanal presence, all right? <laughs> Lenora Foot Beavers, a friend of mine, an inspiration. I am incredibly honored to be able to be here as you receive this award. She has dedicated her entire career to serving this city and providing support to students, particularly minority students. I have had a great time getting to know you, and I am happy every time you are here. So well deserved. To Chris Whiteman, to my left, another honor. He's built a corporate governance advisory firm serving a long and impressive list of Fortune 100 companies. And I earlier, right there at the table, had the honor of telling his mother, I think she did a good job. <laughs> Now, Caroline Witausik, right? I got that right, okay? Uh, we were both lamplighters yesterday. We both received our awards. It is good company to be in. The first woman district attorney in Niagara County. Now that is a tough job. <laughs> and our very own Eileen Fleischman. Yes. That's right. That's right. She loves you more than anyone. She tells me all the time. She tells you how much she loves you. I love you too, but my God, this woman really loves you. Okay. <laughs> she has worked, she's connected thousands of alums. She's worked with us for 34 years, building a network that extends around the world, introducing me, a new baby dean, to all kinds of people. I am incredibly grateful to Eileen. She's also helping to handle our distinguished jury guests in the fall. I can't tell you enough how much I rely on the staff of this law school to make all of our dreams come true. At the end of the day, the dean can only lead, the dean can give a great speech, the dean can ask you for your help, but it is these people who day after day, year after year, get it done. Thank you so much, Eileen. Just a reminder, in case you haven't heard before I wrap up, we are going to have a distinguished Supreme Court jurist visit, August 26, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is going to be in town. That is our first day of class. There is a hashtag trending, hashtag first day of class. I want to thank Jen Shar for kicking that off. Um, and I cannot truly imagine, we have some incoming one else in this audience, a better year to start off at UB Law than with RGB herself in town, right? <laughs> We're setting the threshold high. <laughs> How am I going to top that, right kids? All right. Now remember, that is co-hosted by the Bar Association of Erie County, the Western New York chapter of the Women's Bar Association, the Minority Bar Association. We're all planning on doing this at Klein Hands Music Hall. And I want you to just recognize it means the law school does not walk alone. We go hand in hand with the bar associations, we go hand in hand with the alumni, and in this room are many non-UB Law alumni. You are welcome, you are also needed. We are the law school to walk of Western New York and the state of New York. Thank you for coming. Two more things. 
In the addition to the visit by Justice Ginsburg, we're very pleased to announce that our commencement speaker will be the Honorable Maithi Oronos Rodriguez, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Puerto Rico. As many of you know, the Chief Justice's appearance is a result of the outstanding work of the Puerto Rico Legal Assistance Clinic in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, a trip that would not be possible without the support of many alumni in this room. Every single donation you've made to this clinic has resulted in real change, and I want you to know that she's an inspiring official. I cannot imagine how we survive or how the judiciary would respond if we had no electricity for three months. Just think about how easily the rule of law could fall. But they did an amazing job, and she is a truly inspiring Chief Justice. Finally, I'd like to close with a short video, and then I'll have a few more uh, remarks. But I think it is time for me to let others speak for themselves. Just one more example of UB Law's impact. Last fall, clinical professor Nicole Hallett established the U.S.-Mexico Border Clinic in response to the growing number of women and children detained in the border without proper representation. Once again, our alumni and friends stepped up to fund the travel costs, enabling eight students, six law students, to travel to a detainee center in Dilley, Texas for one week in January. This video was filmed before they left. We are experiencing what has broadly been called a Central American refugee crisis on the southern border. And they're coming to the United States not because they're looking for economic opportunity, but because they're fleeing violence and threats of violence in their home countries. I'm right now teaching a course called the U.S.-Mexico Border Clinic. And as part of this course, the students and I will be spending a week at the U.S.-Mexico border representing detained asylum seekers who have been encountered trying to enter the United States. They have all expressed an interest in applying for asylum and we'll be representing them throughout that process. I want to be an immigration attorney mostly because of my family history. My mom actually migrated to the U.S. through the southern border. Um, and growing up, I would always hear her talk about her story, her migration story, and I would just be in awe. We are doing a two-week short course here at UB, and we're also uh, going to be doing simulations so that they can prepare for what it's going to be like to be in the detention center representing the asylum seekers. When did you arrive to the United States? When did you arrive to the United States? The detention center that we're going to be going to is one that I have actually gone to before and volunteered before. I went in January of 2016. I heard so many stories from, from women and children who had fled absolutely horrendous conditions. It's, it's impossible to leave a week at the border without understanding how crucial it is that we have an asylum system that works in this country and that allows people to get the protection that they need. Immigration's always been an ongoing issue, but right now it's really on that hot seat. Um, so the fact that the law school is getting involved and sending someone as prepared as Professor Hallett is, is amazing. What I found is when I went to the border, it was one of the hardest weeks of my life. It was one of the most rewarding weeks of my life, and I'm really excited to share that experience with students here at UB. In one week, yes, it's good, round of applause. In one week, our clinic represented over 321 women and children at their credible fear interviews. Without a lawyer, there's a 20% success rate. With a lawyer, there's an 80% success rate. Our clinic had a 100% success rate. I just had to show you the video. They work so hard. The students work so hard. We are embracing all different kinds of advocacy. Please continue coming here. Know that it is the privilege of my life to be the dean of this law school. It is also my privilege to call myself your friends. Um, I'm looking forward to even greater years. I don't know how I'm gonna to top next year, honestly. <laughs> um, but I'll try. So be proud of yourselves. Be proud of this community. Um, we do good work. You've done great things. And honor the people who have distinguished themselves today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dean Ramoski. It's truly an honor now to introduce Dr. Satish Tripathi. 
Dr. Tripathany, an internationally distinguished researcher and transformative higher education leader, was appointed the 15th president of the University of Buffalo on April 18, 2011. Dr. Tripathi, who previously served as UB's provost and executive vice president for academic affairs, has led this university in, establish, in achieving significant growth in research and scholarly activities, enhanced student quality and diversity, and an expanded international presence. As president, he is committed to building on this strong foundation, moving the University of Buffalo into the highest ranks of the nation's leading research universities. Before coming to Buffalo, Dr. Tripathi served as Dean of the Bournes College of Engineering at the University of California, Riverside, and was Professor and Department Chair in, Com in Computer Science at the University of Maryland. He is the first international-born president in the University of Buffalo's history. Dr. Tripathi. Good evening, everyone. You know, my introduction was longer than my speech is going to be, so uh, <laughs> I, I have to ask somebody to shorten it. Uh, I'm so pleased to be with all of you this evening. It is wonderful to see five of our School of Law's most distinguished alumni receiving this well-earned recognition. With that, congratulations to all the honorees. And congratulations, Ali. <laughs> you truly embody the values of our university, serving as role models not only for the next generation of lawyers, but for all of our UB students. I would also like to thank the many law alumni in attendance and all the tonight's guests for joining us. It is always a great pleasure for me to have the opportunity to meet with our law school alumni, friends, and supporters. And I meet them not only in Buffalo, but as I travel to New York City, Washington, D.C., California, wherever we go for alumni event, we really have very prominent law school alumni everywhere. Our School of Law is critically important to UB as we continue to pursue our ambitious vision of academic excellence, innovative research and scholarship, and impactful community engagement. Our law school plays a vital ro role in this vision as it has a strong reputation for excellence, produces eight of the 10 attorneys in our region, and it has long-standing commitment to social justice. We have seen this commitment demonstrated time and time again, recently with the establishment of the Puerto Rico Recovery Assistance Legal Clinic, which offers legal aid to citizens recovering from Hurricane Maria, and Veterans Legal Practicum, which provides legal services to veterans, service members, and their families. And of course, you saw the video, the work we are doing with the refugees. Clinics and experimental learning opportunities like these build on our law school's tradition of advocating for, the, for those in need. I deeply appreciate Abiba's commitment to advancing this important part of the law school and UB's mission. She's passionate about building on our law school's culture of innovative interdisciplinary research and learning in the pursuit of justice. I don't have to tell you how passionate she is. You can observe it when she talks to you. I appreciate all that Aviva has done for UB, including her responsiveness to the changing nature of legal education. I'm delighted to have her at the helm of our School of Law, leading the way for the next generation of lawyers and legal professions, professionals. And to tonight's honoree, congratulations again on the well-deserved honor. Thank you.
Thank you very much, President Tripathi. I'd like to take a moment to thank those who made this dinner here tonight happen. The Law Alumni Association acknowledges our underwriters who truly have been there for us, not just at this dinner, but many dinners in the past. Their names are listed on the PowerPoint shows that you'll see on my right and left, and they'll be playing throughout the dinner, and on the many signs on display in the foyer and in the ballroom and in our dinner program. All proceeds from this dinner benefit the activities of the Law Alumni Association. Without the generosity of our sponsors, we would not be able to provide our law students with the tuition and public interest scholarships and our members with the many social, educational, and networking alumni programs that are organized throughout the year, both in Western New York and in our various regional chapter locations. Thank you very much for your support. I'd like to take a moment to thank our dinner co-chairs over here on my left, Kevin Espinosa and Melissa Nixon, in addition to their dinner committee members, which include Scott Becker, Michael Hecker, Amy Hersteck, Elizabeth Krangle, Jim O'Keefe, and Megan Corcoran. <laughs> With the leadership of Kevin and, uh, and Melissa, you guys have done a fantastic job, and the success we have this year will be extremely hard to duplicate in years to come. Thank you very much. I'd like to take a moment to thank the staff in the Alumni Association and the communication offices, specifically Vice Dean Lisa Mueller from the class of 1993. I know she's around here somewhere. I'd like to also, Lisa, are you there? Over there. <laughs> I'd also like to thank Assistant Gold Group Director Pat Warrington and Administrative Assistant Amy Hemperos. Surely, last but not least, I cannot go without thanking Eileen, who will also be thanked later. But with her expertise, this entire thing does not happen. So thank you, Eileen, for all the work. I'd like to take a moment to also ask the officers and the current directors of both the Law Alumni Association and the Gold Group to please stand up. And I'd like to ask the crowd to recognize them for all of the many contributions they've given to the law school and the Law Alumni Association. Truly, both of these boards are fantastic, and we wouldn't be where we are today without them. So if you could stand up for a second, just to recognize for all that you've done. I would also like to thank, and we have many in this room, our past presidents who are in here tonight for all that they've done for over the years, and also the judges in the room, because there are many, many here to, uh, I can't count them all, so if you could just rise for a second, and I uh, want to thank you and acknowledge you for being here. I'd like to take a moment to welcome the new Law Alumni Association incoming directors for the 2019-20 year. Those directors include Robert Bracado from the class of 1990, Frank Ewing from the class of 2012, Terry Bear from the class of 1996, Diane Roberts from the class of 1990, Just Judge Barbara Johnson Lee from the class of 1986, Ryan Crawford from the class of 2006, and Patricia Schicarelli from the class of 1993. If you're here, if you could please rise, one of them. I'd also like to welcome the new Gold Group incoming directors for, two, for, the, for this upcoming year. Daniel Schaus from the class of 2018, Mark Schultz from the class of 2011, Adelina Simpson from the class of 2018, and Kevin Southern, who was my, uh, my, ment my mentee from the class of 2019. So if you're here, we'd like to acknowledge you. Every year at this dinner, if you're aware, this happens on a yearly basis. The Law Alumni Association congratulates members from many years ago, and specifically the class of 1959, who are celebrating their 60th year, and the class of 1969, who are celebrating their 50th year anniversary. A full list of their names are in the program, and all will receive certificates of appreciation for their long service to the profession. So if you could stand up, I'm not sure which tables are those classes, but if you could... 
59 and 69. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Since our last two all alumni celebration events were hugely successful and fun, we've decided to make it an annual alumni weekend with special attention paid to the reunion classes. Now you've probably already received a save the date notice, so please mark your calendars for Saturday, October 26th from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. at the Buffalo Club. So if you do end your year in 2009, I believe, or three, I think those are the, or four or, four, or nine or four, I'll get my math down. Please make sure to be there and everyone else are more than welcome to attend. So thank you very much and hope to see you there. We are going to take a very quick break for dinner um, and at which point after we finish, our, we'll take a break around 7.45, we're gonna start and resume the award ceremony and uh, talk about the great people that are on this dais. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just a couple of things. No, no, you were uh, all of us up here, we hope you're enjoying the 57th uh, Annual Awards Dinner. This was established by the Alumni Association's Board of Directors in 1963, uh, and it recognizes the valuable contributions that UB Law School alumni have made to their profession and community. In our prog program booklet, you will see a lengthy list of the previous recipients, many of whom you will recognize as being giants of our community. Also in our program are the acceptance remarks of tonight's honorees and the highlights of their professional careers. I urge you to please take a minute <laughs> to, uh, uh, to read them. Uh, so stories from our law school's history have become part of a treasure trove of information that has been compiled in an extensive oral history project initiated in 2000. The project, which was funded by Lauren Rackman, who we remember fondly each year at this dinner, has recorded alumni, faculty members, and others with close ties to the law school, preserving their voices for posterity and digitally indexing their words to provide easy access for historians, researchers, and others. One of the association's hardest working committees is the whole Oral History Committee, chaired by Vice President Liz Savino. They spend so much of their time coordinating and producing and conducting all these interviews, some of which you're going to see tonight. All of our six of our honorees have been interviewed as part of this project, and we will feature a clip from each of their interviews as part of the awards presentation. So, without further ado, Kevin Espinoza is going to present the first award. It is my honor this evening to present the award for the judiciary to the Honorable Alexander W. Hunter, Jr., a judge for the United Nations Tribunal, which sits in New York City, Geneva, and Nairobi. When interviewed for the Oral History Project, Judge Hunter explained how he felt that as a minority in the 1960s, he had to work twice as hard and be twice as motivated as others. One, one thing I've always done is I, I've, because of my dad, to relate back to, to, to getting up at five or four o'clock in the morning to go to work with him on Saturdays. Uh, I, learned, I learned how to, how to work hard. I, I, I learned, again, in the 60s, you know, being, being black, being a minority, uh, and it, it did come to pass as being true. We all had to work maybe twice as hard to, to get you know, where others might have gotten uh, with, with a lot less work and a lot less desire. So I just took that with me, that work ethic, and I translated that into um, uh, putting more time and more direction in, into what I did as a, as a professional. As any judge knows, you have to call him as you see him. For Judge Hunter, that's true in the courtroom and on the tennis court. Judge Hunter loves tennis. He's played with the same group of guys for more than a quarter century. And he unfortunately shared with me he has to miss it tomorrow because he's here. <laughs> the scouting report is that Judge Hunter is fast. He can cover a lot of territory. But when he approaches the net, a good lob shot might be effective. <laughs> One of his common doubles partners is Justice Eugene Oliver Jr. of the New York State Supreme Court, Bronx County. If he makes an outrageous call, Justice Oliver reports, he'll walk back to the end line and won't look you in the eye. You know he knows it was a bad call. <laughs> 
Unfortunately, we are honoring Judge Hunter tonight for his distinguished performance in court and not on court. And certainly, he has made a lot of good calls in the courtroom. There is so much for his law school alma mater to be proud of. He has served with distinction at many levels, as a New York City criminal court judge, a New York State Supreme Court justice in Bronx County, and an appellate justice in the First Department. Most recently, Judge Alexander has moved on to the international stage after his appointment as United Nations Dispute Tribunal Judge, hearing the appeals of UN employees who are contesting administrative decisions. Judge Hunter has streamlined operations and working at full efficiency has made a sizable dent in the tribunal's substantial backlog of cases. I consider myself to be an international civil servant, the judge has said, and I wear that badge of honor proudly. He also wears the robes with a real sense of the huge responsibility any judge sip entails. If you're arguing in Judge Hunter's courtroom, you know you need to be on time, be prepared, and get to the point. Sharon A. M. Aaron served as Judge Hunter's principal law clerk. She's now a Supreme Court Appellate, Appellate Division Justice in the Third Department and says a lot of what she does today was learned while sitting at the judge's side. One thing she learned is that how you treat people matters. Judge Hunter, she says, is very proper and formal, but he's also very approachable. He showed me that you can do your job, make people understand that this is a professional environment, but also let them know there's compassion there. Regardless of the outcome, how you deliver the news makes a difference. You want them to leave saying, I don't agree with the judge, but he or she gave me a fair trial. Judge Hunter teaches at Pace School of Law, and those whom he has taken under his wing know that he's teaching all the time. If he sees potential in you, he won't let you get away with, with wasting it. Not everyone will be receptive to that, Justice Aaron says, but he's always willing to share, to give you his experience and expertise. Whenever anything is going on that fit my skill set, he would always drag me along. He's always trying to help bring someone along, and I became a professor because of him. His heart is so big. It's that ideal combination, the impartiality and effectiveness of a skilled jurist, and the commitment to nurture the next generation to administer justice that we celebrate tonight. And so please join me in congratulating Judge Alexander W. Hunter, Jr. as we present him with the Distinguished Alumnus Award for the Judiciary. Daniel C. Oliverio, partner and chairman emeritus at Hodgson Russ, is this year's recipient of our award for excellence in private practice. During his oral history interview, Dan described the qualities a private practitioner needs to succeed. You can't just look at an academic resume in a law school and say you're going to be a good lawyer because the practice of law is primarily other than what you learn in law school. It's judgment, confidence, inspiring confidence in clients, being able to sense opportunities and take advantage of them, being able to focus on what the problem really is. It's not an academic exercise. At Hots and Russ, it's a business exercise. As I've told you and others, the first question should be of a client is, what's your business objective at a place like Hots and Russ? has nothing to do with torts or contracts or UCC or any of that other stuff. Everybody has access to that who's a lawyer. Where lawyers distinguish themselves are on things like judgment, common sense, sensing opportunities, the ability to make your way through a difficult problem, to negotiate, to make an impression, all those other things that you just learn in life. When you think of the characteristics of some of the most iconic lawyers in history, the things that come to mind are professionalism, fierce advocacy, impeccable judgment, compassion, and uncompromising morals. Dan Oliverio has all of those qualities and more. Whether it be in the courtroom, at the negotiating table, or in the boardroom, Dan inspires confidence in his clients and anxiety in his opponents. Dan has built a national reputation, especially in false claims act cases and in white-collar criminal defense. He has a presence, one prominent local judge says. 
When Dan Alvario walks into the courtroom, if he's your lawyer, everything is going to be all right. <laughs> Dan truly serves as a counselor at law, a lawyer who will always be there when his client needs the calm, competent assurance that no matter what's going on, there's a way forward. University presidents and deans, CEOs, COOs, CFOs, the people who run the businesses and public institutions that are the backbone of Western New York, seek out Dan's perspective on all kinds of issues. Jody Lameo, CEO of Collida Health, says Dan is as talented an attorney as I've ever worked with. He has the rare ability to navigate very, very difficult legal situations and boil them down into something lay people can understand. You can't fake caring, and when you're with Dan, you are the most important client in his world at that moment. And Rich Gold, President and Chief Operating Officer of M&T Bank, calls him an important ally for the bank for as long as I can remember. Dan is the guy we call when we're being too narrow-minded in our thinking and we need some perspective. Just to have him to talk to has been invaluable. The character that has taken Dan to such heights in his career was formed early in life. Growing up, Dan developed his fierce competitive spirit playing in basketball and football at the Boys and Girls Club, the Butler Mitchell Program on Buffalo's West Side, and the Niagara Falls YMCA. He was a terrific athlete, evidenced by the fact that he's in the Niagara Falls Sports Hall of Fame. When his colleagues at Hodgson Russ tried to get him to join the company's softball team, he modestly begged off. Dan's childhood competitive spirit is on full display in his work, but there's a more meaningful connection that he holds onto from his youth. He's deeply committed to young people in tough circumstances, and he is dedicated to helping them succeed. He keeps in touch with priests and community organizations, both in the Falls and in the city of Buffalo, and wants to know about kids who have potential, but just don't have the resources to do their best. And Dan, very quietly, helps make it happen for them, helping them with tuition for the best schools, a computer, whatever they may need. He makes it possible for underprivileged kids, scores of them, to compete on a level playing field. And he does it personally, privately, and, I suppose until now, completely anonymously. That just personifies who Dan is, working hard to build an incredible career and a great life, then reaching back to make it possible for kids who are just like he was to do the same. It's a record of achievement and compassion that makes us all proud. And so for his leadership by example in private practice, I'm honored to present the Distinguished Alumnus Award to a great friend and former colleague, Daniel C. Oliverio. The award for community service is presented this evening to Lenora Foote Beavers, executive assistant to the presiding justice, Gerald J. Whalen. In her oral history interview, Lenora spoke about the obligation of the bench and the bar to provide community service. You know, all my friends know that um, I really am that type of person that just loves to have a good time, but um, I am serious about making changes in our community. Um, one of the things that um, I feel is that we, we as a group of people, um, attorneys, we have that obligation and um, everyone knows that I kind of stay on them about what are you doing for the ones coming behind us? What are you doing to make sure that we are making things better for everyone? And, and, and right now, many people know that my focus is diversifying our, our legal profession and really making our profession look like the community we serve. Over their careers, it is not unusual for lawyers to move from government work to private practice. Not so for Lenora. My heart, she has said, is in being a public servant. Servant leadership, it's called, and Lenora has made herself that kind of public servant in every imaginable area. Check the record of any organization or institution that makes life better in Western New York, and chances are you'll find Lenora's footprints on, fingerprints on the work it does. She's just super committed to making everything she does better, says Joyce Hartsfield, Executive Director of the Franklin H. Williams Commission, which works to make sure people of color are treated fairly in the court system. 
She gives 100% of herself, and she gives it in a very upbeat and committed way. She's a person who sees where things could be made better, and she works to make them better. That means figuring out how to work with diverse groups of people who may not all want the same thing, bringing them together toward a common goal, and doing it with tact, grace, and good humor. It helps that Lenora has an incredible memory. She knows when and where she met that person and something about the person that left a lasting impression. It also means committing not just to making policy decisions, but really rolling up her sleeves and immersing herself in the work and the mission of the organization. And it means spending great amounts of time and energy in working with our students, especially minority students, to help them navigate the rigors of law school and get a foothold in the profession. That's truly central to who she is, says Ann Joint, who has worked extensively with Nora in the women's bar. She is really tireless in mentoring students. She understands the value of a network and imparts that to the students coming up. She actively goes out and looks for people who need assistance. That generosity with her time extends as well to anyone in the Western New York legal community looking for guidance. That means countless lunches, cups of coffee, and long conversations with people who want to pick her brain about how to get more involved. Lenora is literally always on call for people who need her, Joint says. She truly is trying to better the professional experiences of those around her. Underlying her work is a deep Christian faith, and recognizing that is essential to understanding Lenora's service. I know she finds tremendous strength in her faith, says her friend, Justice Shirley Troutman. Not speaking about it so much, but showing it in the work that she does. She never gets discouraged with the twists and turns of life. Whenever you don't get what you want, how you handle disappointment, she does that with grace and dignity, and that comes from her faith. Which is not to say that it's all serious business all the time. Those who know Lenora well know how much, she, how much joy she puts into every situation. She'll come into my office saying, I just need a minute, Justice Troutman says. An hour and a half later, we're still talking. But because she's such a wonderful person, time you spend with her goes by quickly. Community service with a smile, it just doesn't get any better. And so for her deep commitment to our community and the thousand ways that has played out, I'm proud to present the Distinguished Alumna Award to my classmate, Lenora Foot Beavers. We are presenting the award for business achievement as a lawyer to Christopher A. Whiteman of PJT Partners in San Francisco, California. When interviewed, Chris described how his relationships with faculty and alumni from UB School of Law were transformational to his future career in finance. Schlegel, one of the legendary professors, uh, who I think has been there since the 1800s at, uh, at, at UB Law School. I took 12 credits with him. Um, you know, he did not teach corporations in the traditional way. You know, here's a course book, read it, do that. You can, you know, you can talk about your duty of care and your duty of loyalty and all of your kind of Delaware law duties and cover that on the bar exam. But the conversations that we had about current events and how corporate law fit into that in, in modern life at the time in the class was really impactful for me. And then he also connected me with another alum named Tom Bremer, who was general counsel of a company called U.S. Surgical at the time. Uh, he had graduated years before. Um, and did a summer internship program at U.S. Surgical. So, um, you know, Schlegel said to me one day, hey, graduate named Tom Bremer, he's general counsel of a company down in Connecticut. He's looking for somebody, you're the guy. And so I ended up getting a life-changing internship in Norwalk, Connecticut uh, in the summer between my second and third year. Uh, you know, I did not necessarily follow the traditional route of going to the big New York law firm and, and doing that, but it was really impactful experience. <laughs> When Diane Whiteman has to travel away from their California home, her husband Chris has the place to himself. It never fails, 
He pulls out his old electric guitar and puts it in the middle of the living room. The amp, too. Music is a big part of Chris Whiteman's life and always has been. Since his high school days, when he grew his hair long like Paul Stanley and holed up in the basement playing Dynasty album by Kiss over and over. <laughs> He's never left that behind. He's still a Kiss groupie and flew all the way to Columbus, Ohio in March to see their show. And every year, he and his brother Scott head up to Chicago for the Lollapalooza Festival. Kind of a rock and roll soul for a guy who has staked out such a major claim on corporate America. As a partner in what's now known as PJT Partners, Chris works with a heavy hitter list of publicly traded Fortune 100 companies, advising them on how to deal with activist shareholders, proxy voting, and corporate governance issues. From its beginnings as a two-man operation in 2012, PJT Partners has grown to become a major player in the corporate governance ecosystem with over 200 clients. Chris and Abe Friedman, his partner in starting the firm, were both advising large index fund companies and saw the need for corporations they invested in to better manage their shareholder relations. But the new venture wasn't easy. The subject matter was the same, but the intensity and pace was a completely different world. Friedman says, it's an always on, 24 seven, no errors advice business to CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. It was like showing up to run a marathon when you never even put on running shoes. But they have flourished, with Chris playing a major role as rainmaker for the business, something that doesn't come naturally for him. He had to go and convince all these Fortune 100 companies that they needed our help, Friedman says. These are companies that are advised by all the biggest and best corporate minds. They didn't really understand what we did. It's a long way from Chris's years at UB Law. Diane remembers showing up in an apartment in the morning, sometimes to find him asleep at his studies, his head on those thick law books like the world's most uncomfortable pillow. I've always thought of him as an old soul, Diane says. In most ways, he's mature beyond his years, and he's just one of the smartest people I've ever met. The things he didn't know about, he wanted to learn about. He never wants to be the smartest guy in the room. It was a leap of faith, she says, to leave their home in Pennsylvania and move across the country to start PJT Partners. But their three children all now live within driving distance, and by all reports, Chris has embraced the laid-back California lifestyle. They joke in the office about the, and I need a picture of this, the purple pants and Ugg boots that he wears sometimes. Where else but California could you get away with that? And there's nothing sweeter than having grandchildren close by. Diane reports that their new granddaughter, Ilana, who's going on five months old, will sleep in Chris's arms for hours. The law school often reminds our students that their degree opens up all sorts of opportunities, not necessarily in a law office. Chris has taken that idea and run with it. And so to honor that success and that commitment, it is my privilege tonight to present the Distinguished Alumnus Award for Business to Christopher A. Whiteman. Next, we honor Caroline Botasic, the first female district attorney elected in Niagara County for her extraordinary commitment to public service. In her interview, Caroline spoke of the need for compassion that her office must provide to victims of crime and their families. One thing I say to my office all the time is our job is to compassionately navigate victims of crime through the criminal justice system. That is our number one goal. We meet people who have gone through the worst, sometimes, uh, experience in their entire life. And they look to us like, how are you gonna help me? How are you going to make this okay for me to go forward? How are you going to get justice? How are you gonna make sure this doesn't happen to somebody else? And that falls on our shoulders. And I, I think, you know, the perspective that I bring to the office as a female is not just getting, you know, the person who's guilty of a crime convicted of that crime, but being compassionate with the victims and their families while they're going through it.
The first thing that you need to know about Caroline Wojtasek is that she is tenacious and unwavering in her pursuit of justice. Sometimes Western New York's second biggest county needs a tough DA, and Caroline certainly fits the bill. Caroline spent a dozen years as an assistant district attorney. She's the best trial attorney our office has ever seen, says Holly Sloma, Niagara County's first assistant district attorney. You know you're in the presence of someone special, and she had that back when she was fresh out of law school. That impulse toward protecting the public order runs deep. Kim Sebastian, one of her classmates in law school, says Caroline kept them all in line. She's somebody who truly is motivated by the common good to do what she wants to do in life, Sebastian says. It's always been an incredible burning passion in for her. I just get the sense that she's wearing a cape. <laughs> the road hasn't been without bumps. Caroline's father, Ken Hooper, says it was at SUNY Brockport that she really started to hit her stride, studying political science and sociology and eventually graduating magna cum laude. She never settled for the easy road. For her semester abroad, she went to Oxford University, where they make you read your essays to dons, who then critique them to your face. In case you're wondering, Caroline wrote about British political history and third world gender issues. Presenting her essay to the dons certainly toughened her up and prepared her for her legal career. As a prosecutor, Caroline has had to be tough, but that's tempered by a deep empathy for the people who have been victimized by crimes. I've seen tears in her eyes when she talks about situations she deals with, Sebastian says. She feels so deeply for the circumstances. And ADA Sloma recounted how she has sat with her as she personally consoled the victim's families face to face. She has a way of assuring the people who sit at her conference table that on her watch, she's going to seek justice. Whatever the case is, she takes none of it lightly. She has a true sincerity about victims and their families that I think is remarkable. The balance between toughness and empathy extends to her colleagues at the DA's office as well. Sloma says Caroline just won't stop preaching to her colleagues about work-life balance, watching over them like a second family. When she first became the boss, she took everyone on a retreat to Camp Keenan in Lockport. They went home with a real sense of teamwork and perhaps a million mosquito bites as well. <laughs> She'll send everybody out for community service workday, swinging hammers with Habitat for Humanity. And when the Bills finally made the playoffs, she wore her Zubas and jersey to the office. <laughs> Fortunately, she did not need to go to court that day. Her friends and colleagues also point out that for all the responsibilities she manages, Caroline creates that own balance in her life, caring for three children and going on date nights with her husband, Henry. Every afternoon, she takes a FaceTime call from her son, Ryan, when he gets home from middle school. In her office, where it would normally say district attorney, the nameplate on her desk says, best mom ever. There are lots of ways to be a great prosecutor, and Caroline has found a way that works for everybody. She has shown a real commitment to the public good, and for that I'm pleased tonight to present the Distinguished Alumna Award for Public Service to Caroline A. Wotasek. Sorry, another one of my classmates. <laughs> Just had to rub that in. <laughs> Tonight we present our non-alumna award to Eileen Fleischman, Vice Dean of Alumni. <laughs> and our first and only Executive Director of the Law Alumni Association. In her oral history interview, she discusses how richly satisfying she finds working with her law alumni volunteers to benefit their law school. I see my job as connecting alumni with each other, making networks, introducing people. I enjoy getting to know people. I'm very curious, which is why I was a good features reporter. I like to ask questions. And I like to, I get a very, um, I get a feeling of satisfaction of, of creating something from nothing. Now, I don't do this alone. I have collaborated with a great group of people. First of all, the alumni are always teaching me. They're doing the hard work. They're helping. Nothing could happen without the hard work and the engagement of the alumni. Um, and I take pride in 
making relationships so that they'll want to do that. And I want, and I treat my alumni volunteers the way I want to be treated as a volunteer. I have often volunteered in the community, and I know how volunteers want to feel and want to be treated, and that's what I try to do. If you just do what Eileen says, everything will go well. <laughs> That's the wisdom Judge Barbara Howe has developed in working with Eileen Fleischman, whom we recognize tonight for her long service to UB Law and the community. She's the ultimate hostess, Judge Howe says, in everything from what the photos should look like to where we should stand, how the occasion should flow, who should introduce whom. She functions in many ways as an ambassador. Ken Manning saw that diplomacy firsthand back when he was president of the Law Alumni Association. Arranging a law school luncheon in New York City, he had invited Rudy Giuliani to speak, but then there was trouble. A lot of people were upset about Mayor Giuliani's stop and frisk policies, and it looked like there would be raucous protesters outside the Union League Club. Arrests were likely, and the club was threatening to cancel the whole event. It was Eileen at her best, Manning says, a very strong, determined woman. She went to the mayor's people, the protest leaders, even the club's board of directors, and negotiated an elegant solution. The mayor would take questions in public, and the protesters, in turn, agreed not to raise hell outside. What could have been a disaster, Manning says, turned into a meaningful academic experience posing hard questions to a sitting mayor. That kind of creative thinking has been Eileen's hallmark throughout her tenure at the School of Law, both in our relationship building communications and outreach to alumni. Eileen came to UB Law after a career in journalism, both nationally and locally. And that background has shown itself in the quality of the law school's publications, which were almost non-existent before she was hired on in 1985. She started UB Law Forum and grew it into the lively, award-winning, full-color magazine it is today. She worked her Rolodex, if you remember those, <laughs> to get media coverage for the law school. She started a faculty scholarship brochure to increase our faculty's visibility, created view books to attract great students, and brought us into the internet age with UB's first website, our online newsletter, and now online marketing of the school. Perhaps just as important, Eileen has engineered a dramatic expansion of our alumni outreach, so that now our alumni engagement is the highest on campus. If you've ever been a part of the UB Law Alumni Association or the Gold Group, if you've given to our capital campaigns or our annual fund, if you celebrated women lawyers in 1999 or welcomed Justice Scalia or attended the 125th anniversary, if you've been to the Students of Color dinner or the Buffalo Law Review dinner, you've been a part of what Eileen has built. Sometimes she's done that through sheer force of personality. In a crowd, says Anna Vanko, she'll come up to a group of two or three people to talk. And when she leaves that group, she leaves you happy and in a good mood. Even if she just corralled you into doing some job, you're feeling good about yourself. <laughs> Every year at orientation, she introduces herself as Dean Eileen, Queen of Parties. And you know that at bottom, it's all about the students. My satisfaction came from supporting the students during their time at the law school and seeing them go on to wonderful careers, Eileen says. I would get the biggest kick when they invited me to their weddings. There's no one else who is more strongly identified with our law school or has, who has done more to build it into a force to be reckoned with. And so we celebrate tonight as we recognize Eileen R. Fleischman with the award for outstanding service to the university and the community by a non-alumna.
All right, how can you follow that? So that will conclude the festivities for tonight. Just one more thank you. Thank you to a guy who always deflects praise from himself onto other people, who has been a fantastic president this year. Thank you, Mark Brown. And have a good night.